Okay, so like I was saying, Graham, thanks a million for uh, doing this. And uh, it's, it's nice to have this like the first rugby player I've done on the Warriors code. And I'm intrigued to hear your background on obviously how you got to the level you got to and the things you've learned along the way. So we'll crack off with, I suppose, what does like what does performance mean to you? And like, what's the frame that you've put around that performance piece so far in your career? Um, I think the sort of the longer I've gone on in my career, I think the, the importance of the preparation for me. Um, so I'm a little sort of think about this last night, and you know, as I'm getting, I'm 30 now, which in our sport is is considered, you know, towards the end of it anyway. So <laughs> yeah. the the preparation in sort of getting your body ready, because um, obviously the physicality of the sport, um, and also like. I, I run the sort of line out and do have a lot to do with that in the game. So the preparation for that, making sure that, you know, you do your work in the week. So when you come to the game and you and you blow in in the 70th minute that you can, you can sort of think, think clearly, but also have that, have that sort of preparation that's in, in the bank and you know that you can sort of make those right decisions. So and there's, there's plenty of stuff around the preparation. There's the diet, there's all that, that perhaps people don't see when you're at the club. Mm. But, you know within yourself when you sort of go out on a Saturday or whenever that you've you've either made the right decisions during the week or you haven't. And I think the longer I've gone on in in the sport, that's become more and more important. Um, you know, with the level of physicality and basically the freaks coming through in the game now. Um, someone for me who's got quite a few miles on the clock, that sort of preparation and using my experience to sort of help with that. You know, I think when you get to perhaps my age and a little bit older, that's that's the key for me, I think. You think, uh, it's, it's funny you say that. I think I look back on some of the rugby players that we had here in Ireland over the years and you can almost see that transition as their career goes on where maybe earlier in their career they used their like raw athleticism a little bit more. Like Brian O'Driscoll like, jumps out at me as somebody who, when he came onto the scene first, he was like, you know, putting his head in everywhere and, and like, you know, using his speed. But as his career went on and maybe he lost those first couple of yards, it was his brain and his, like, as you say, like his preparation and his using his experience that still allowed him to be one of the best players in the world, even if he hadn't quite the athleticism as he had earlier in his career. Um, do you think there's any way that you can, if you were to look back earlier in your career, can you only gain that through experience? Or do you think that was through <clears throat> maybe other training methods or could you have been pushed in a different direction in your train in earlier in your career to gain it sooner or is it purely like time time and yeah in the saddle I guess that, that, that gets you there yeah, not not necessarily I don't think I, I, I say I think there's perhaps a little bit of naivety when you start out but I, I was sort of thrown in quite young um you just you're just a young kid and you just you just want to run around you got loads of energy and not that experience whereas maybe if you did have someone you know I don't know a, a senior pro sort of maybe giving you a few few tips and hints and I mean I learned a lot off Brad Thorne when he came to Leicester um, obviously he's a guy who's done everything in in both codes of the game and he he taught me a lot especially about the sort of physical preparation I mean he was I think he was 39 40 when I played with him at Leicester which is, is um, but the reason he could he could still put his body through what he did was because of how well he sort of prepared during the week right so I took I took a lot from him, and and you will sort of learn learn stuff during your career, I suppose. Um, but you know stuff like the diet, stuff like the preparation for the lineout, stuff like you know learning your plays. I mean that that should be second nature, and and sometimes in our game it's it's not. Yeah, but it's having that discipline to sort of do that week in week out, um, and that was that was another thing I thought about. I suppose that you need to have a sort of system that's that's repeatable. Mm. Maybe slightly different in golf. I don't know how often your, your sort of tournaments are, but we're playing every week, you know, in in pretty big blocks. So you need to have a, I'd say you need to have a system that works for you, but isn't so sort of mentally draining that you know yeah. you do three four weeks and you, you're absolutely spent. You know, you still need to have that that element of you know, time to yourself, that relaxation, and you're not constantly thinking, oh, what have I eaten or you know, do I need to do another 10 minute stretching or you know, do I need to watch another half an hour of footage? That's an interest. Yourself. That's an interesting one in rugby. And I spoke to so um Vinnie Hammond, who would be the Irish rugby team's like 
head top analytics uh, guy. Um, Vinny, I, I talked to Vinny about that a lot where in golf, because we're such a low intensity sport, we can train all day pretty much without fatigue and physically, but you know, obviously there's a mental taxation there, but in rugby, like he was saying, like when they do a Lions tour, or they do a, a World Cup tour, you're only allowed really 60, 90 minutes training time with players sometimes between matches. And I was, in, I was so interested to know, that was obviously maybe from the coaching team's background, but I'm intrigued to ask you from a player's perspective, when you have so much time maybe in between games when you're not training and you're not maybe in the gym, how do you switch off? How do you take your head out of the battle to allow it to like, you know, recover, to prepare yourself to go into battle maybe, you know, that Saturday or whatever the case may be? Yeah, and that's, like I say, like, that is that is the battle, isn't it? It's making sure that you do switch off because, you know, like I say, come the fourth or fifth week of you know, back-to-back Premiership and European games, you're going to be fried. And don't get me wrong, that's that's happened to me before and it's, it's kind of recognising that and, and trying to get out of it. Um, for me, I've, I suppose I have a few interests outside of rugby. Um, okay, very good. You know, trying to balance those during the week, but I'm do I do a bit of studying or or whatever it is. Yeah, uh, that gives you a sort of focus outside of uh, outside of the rugby, and when you're doing that, you're not you're not thinking about anything anything for the time. Um, using your days off well, so we we'd have a day off in the week, usually the Wednesday if we're playing sort of Saturday to Saturday, and that's an important day. Um, sometimes I'll go in and get treatment. Or you know, just have a complete day at home, not not do too much, or you know, do half an hour of, of preparation or whatever I need to do. But right. again, making sure that you're you've sort of planned your week out, you're comfortable with your own methods, so you can sort of tick that off, and you're not sort of worrying about oh, have I, have I left this too long, or should I be doing this? It's it's planning it out, and I guess that does come with the experience as well, you know, knowing sort of what works for you because. I've had probably when I was a bit younger, I probably went a little bit too far the other way and you find yourself on your days off, you know, you can watch maybe an hour or so of, of line out footage and, you know, that's not good for anyone. So. <laughs> <laughs> I don't see line out footage on Netflix. Oh yeah, exactly. <laughs> but yeah, it's manageable and making sure that you've got stuff away from, away from the game, that your life is not just focused around rugby or whatever your sport is. You know, um, I suppose one of the common trends of all the athletes and, and, and players I've spoken to is that competitiveness piece and, you know, to do what you do and especially the physical toll that you guys put yourselves under in rugby. Um, I presume there has to be a fairly strong will to compete and to win and to, you know, to want to be out there, I guess, for you to stick at it for as long as you... And, and to put yourself through. I'm sure you've had plenty of injuries over the years and stuff like that. So, um did you always have that? Like when you look back at your early days when you were playing schoolboy rugby and stuff, and maybe just like before you made the decision to, to turn professional and stuff, what was the what was the driving force that was driving you to get out there week and week and compete and train and you know train harder than maybe guys that were your same age at a similar level that never made it to the levels that you did? Um, yeah, I, I think I'm I'm a competitive person definitely, um, and I think that. For our level at, at school, the sort of progressions, they were, I don't know, they were, they were quite obvious. So you go, you sort of play for your region and then, sorry, your county, your region, and then you sort of play for like England under 16s or whatever. And, and that was the sort of age I sort of started taking rugby really seriously. And you could, you could kind of see those progressions quite clearly. Um, right. But once you'd hit one, you're like, well, I've gone to the county now, I want to, you know, I want to go to the region and I I was at a good sort of rugby school and a lot of my good mates played it and, you know, we're all sort of pushing each other on and I think that right. I wasn't doing it by myself. Okay. And that's that's where it first started, I think. And then, you know, once you get into the England under 16s, it's then, well, you need to get into the England under 18s for the next year and then the England under 20s where you get to go to a World Cup. And and I think at, at that age anyway, there's, there's clear progressions. Mm-hmm. There's always something you can mark yourself at. You can you see boys that you're, you know, you're maybe jumping ahead of, and it's quite encouraging. Um, yeah. To those levels, and I guess by the time you get to sort of England under twenties, that's when you're looking to to sign maybe a pro contract, and 
you've had two, two three years of, of high level competitive rugby and and then you go into a professional sort of environment and you've got to start at the bottom and then it's about for me I remember I just really wanted to prove myself you know it was I saw saw really good professional players but I thought you know I've I can I can play at this level, and that was the sort of driver for me to keep pushing and to be as good as I could, as young as I as young as I could be. So you saw the guys that were there. You believed like I, I can play. I'm as good as that. I'm as good as they are. So now it's just a matter of me proving that to those around me. Was that the? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, I, I definitely had that. I think you got to have, haven't you? You got to have that big time, yeah. Belief, um, regardless of if it's. If it's correct or not. <laughs> um, yeah, I definitely believed in myself, and I think I wanted to do, like I say, I wanted to do it as young as I possibly could because I thought, well, what an achievement if I can, you know, start ten games in the Premiership when I'm 19, or you know, and those those little things. I guess again, that was a clear progression for me. That's I wanted to yeah. start ten games, and then I wanted to, you know, be first choice the next season. And but even if you don't hit it, you still you still sort of reaching for something. And what's been what's been the hardest part of being a professional rugby player? Like, when you, like or the biggest challenge, I guess. What 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 was the what's what's been the piece of your career so far where you've been like, geez, I didn't know it was going to be like this when I was turning pro. Or what was the biggest challenge you've faced so far? Um, well, I think I remember my first year as as a pro. I was asking the guys, you know, how long we got off for Christmas. Um, <laughs> So that was a uh, that was a bit of a wake up, but I think I think the last you know maybe two three years, especially when I was at Leicester, when we were playing obviously big Premiership games and we we're playing um, in the Champions Cup as well, which you know there's absolutely no let off in, in intensity, and we could be going for sort of 10, 10, 11 weeks straight, and those are tough times, you know, that when you're sort of playing every weekend. At a really high level, from maybe end of October to middle of January, um, and the weather's pretty average. Yeah, it's tough, yeah. Um, we were going through a pretty tough time, so I think maybe we won one out of ten in that period. And that's it becomes a physical battle, obviously, because of the nature of the sport. But you know, a big mental battle as well when you're coming in and it's dark every morning, and you know you're going to go into a couple of meetings and get a bit of a hammering. And then do it all over again at the weekend. You know, you got. I remember we had Saracens, Exeter, and then two games against Racing Metro, mm -hmm. one of the best teams in France. You know, in, in four weeks, and that's that's mentally tough. And I think that's that's the hardest bit of it for me is is sort of backing up those those efforts. You know, you put in a massive effort on the Saturday, maybe lose. It's obviously pretty devastating, and you. Know, mm -hmm. Can't, can't move and then you've got to come back on the Monday and watch yourself be sort of pretty brutally honest with your performance and then go and do the same thing again and just keep backing that up keep backing that up so um, for me that's that's the hardest bit sort of physically and, and mentally that's that's like the big part of you know I suppose the difference between being an amateur and a professional is like a professional has to go to work despite you know like an amateur can drop out at any stage if they want to, do you know what I mean? But like you have to go into battle, even you have to take each loss in the chain, but you have to renew yourself quite quickly, don't you? And and be ready to go again the following week. And what I suppose like what sustains you during those periods when confidence maybe is a bit low, you haven't got a huge amount to believe in, but you know you need to be up for the next match or it's, you're never going to get yourself out of that. And I'm sure you've had periods where you've been like the team and yourself have been on and come up out of it. What is it that gets you out of that bottom end of the curve until you, you know, get to the rise again? Um, I think it's, I think as a team, it's, it's that staying positive and that's where I think the analysis we do is, is really important. Um, because there's got to be there's got to be a lot of positive reinforcement, I think, especially when you're struggling. Yeah, probably more so than when you're winning. Right. Um, because, like I say, if you're doing four, five, six games in a row where you're losing, there will be good things you're doing. But if you just keep hearing about all the you know all the mistakes, like why are you doing this here? 
you know, we're not good enough. It's just going to turn into a horrible, vicious circle. And I've seen situations where that's been the case. And then I've seen situations where, yes, we've touched on mistakes, but we've turned them into, tried to turn them into positives and stuff we can learn from. And I think that keeps the, the spirits of the group as high as I guess possibly could be. Um, to go out and eventually it will turn because yeah. every time we play them, we've got really good players capable of playing really good rugby and most games in rugby you're not going to play really badly for 80 minutes it's at the top level it's it's really small sort of detail so chances are you will have done a lot of good things in the game so focus on those and then you know, eventually those little you know five ten percent will go your way and you know, that's when you sort of get that upward curve it's like pockets of time, <clears throat> like, you know what I mean? You'll never play a perfect game, but you can have perfect moments within a game. And it's like trying to gather as many of those perfect moments as you can over a, like a, I suppose, an 80 minute period for us to be over 18 holes or over a 72 hole tournament. But it can be, as you said, I remember like, you know, Tiger Woods talking about that before where whenever he was coming back, maybe after a, like a, all he was looking for was to see a good six holes and then a good 12 holes and then he put together a good 18 holes yeah. um, and it can be I suppose I'm interested in your experience on that a friend of mine came up with a good one he was like when you're winning it feels like you're looking in a mirror but when you're losing you're looking through a window so like when you're losing you're looking through the window to see who you can blame and when you're winning you're looking in the mirror and you can always see the good things and what everybody's doing you know and it's maybe having the ability to switch those two around during those like tough periods, you know? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, on your successes um, and your good times over your career, can you, like they often say that success leaves clues. Um, what would be the clues that you see when you look back over your career that led to the, the great moments and, 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 the, and the most success you enjoyed? Um. I think so the, the two probably most successful years I had or the I'd say the most successful environments were when I was at Leicester the first maybe a couple of years I was there and we got we lost in the final the first year and then won the final the second year um, and I think they were really tough environments um, but there was a I just remember thinking there was just such a sort of concrete belief amongst the whole team that we were going to get ourselves out of any hole that that we, we kind of found ourselves in. Um, so that first season was the World Cup season and it was, I think we were missing maybe 10, 12 of our sort of first team regulars and we started off horrendously. I think we were bottom or second bottom, you know, coming into Christmas right. and we made the final. And I remember thinking when those guys came back, those senior guys, those leaders in the team, they came back and you notice the difference when we were on the pitch because there was, you know, there was absolute clarity in what we were doing, but there was, you know, a real belief that, you know, if we were 20 points down or if we were 20 points up, we knew what we were doing and we knew we could, we could win the game. And probably over the years kind of lost that a little bit, but you kind of looking at those senior guys there. And I think that was just a, really really strong mentality and it was probably came through the way we trained we trained really hard and it wasn't wasn't always pleasant you know you, you would do long long hours and perhaps training that you know I probably wouldn't do now if I'm honest you know this yeah. was probably, what, seven eight years ago but you know it all contributed to that sort of that really tough mentality and and it worked you know we didn't I got to a final from being pretty much bottom of the table and Isn't it? the next year and and it was it was really a, it was tough, but it was a pleasure to be a part of. It's amazing, like isn't it? Sometimes uh, you like your the first thing you'd, you'd use to describe that was it was a tough environment, and it's like I've seen that as well. Sometimes, like a lot of the best players that we've seen come through our systems and stuff, they don't always come. It, it doesn't come from like the smoothest of like you know backgrounds, and you know usually they a lot of the players need that real like. Whether that's through experience or design, if you get me, whether that's through like like just life has, has toughened them up or whether that's through like the training environments that they were subjected to were developed that resilience in them. But, you know, even for you guys to have that resilience to come to the final and lose and then bounce back straight away the next year and actually win it, like I, I can imagine that must have been an unbelievable validation of the work that had gone in the previous two years. 
yeah, it definitely makes it definitely makes it sweeter. Um, but when when we lost that final, Leicester weren't they weren't used to losing finals, and you know, looking back, it was it was a very obviously a sombre mood in the dressing room. But it was almost like you know that's that's not an acceptable it's not an acceptable standard for us, and and that sort of I think that fueled everyone the next season, and there was even more sort of I guess belief that we were going to win because of we almost let ourselves down the year before and you sort of think getting to a final is actually a great achievement um, and at that time I didn't I didn't really process with me because all I could I was getting from the young lad and all the senior boys and from the coaches it was like that's that's not that standard it's not good enough um, but you know it's it's just that mentality isn't it and that was that's the biggest thing I'd take away from those early sort of years there and the what was it like? You know, the, you know when you got to the final, um, was there any sense of fuck? I hope we don't lose again. Or how did you just manage that? Like you've lost last year's final, you get into the next year's final. How do you how do you deal with that piece of like like are you solely focused? Are you so focused on like the win that you can't even remember last year? Or did you did you did you just deal with that? Or how did you how did you manage that piece? I think we. I don't remember having any of those thoughts, you know, just before the game or in, even in the lead up to the game. I think what we did quite well was just sort of just got rid of it, flushed it quite early on in, in the pre-season. Um, obviously, it was underlying motivation for us during the season, but right. sort of addressed it. And I don't remember it being being spoken about. You know, it was everything was clear. And I guess when you get to that stage, there's not too much need to sort of go back. Everyone who played the last year will be feeling it. It's, I guess it's, it's obvious, isn't it? But <laughs> yeah. the coaches and if, you know, if the captain keeps banging on about it, senior players keep reminding you about it. It's, I don't think it's that helpful. Yeah. So you, so you just kept your eyes on the road ahead as opposed to the road behind? Yeah. Obviously address it, you know, start of the season or, or whenever. And I think, I think we did that and we, we sort of, Put it to bed, um, and if individually, I guess if you needed it as your motivation for the game, then so be it. But the, the sort of plan we had, and, and the clarity, and the, the belief that we were going to win was was enough, really. Well, <clears throat> one of the um, I suppose one of the interesting questions that I kind of wanted to speak to, because I think you're in a unique position to talk about it, is, and you mentioned it a little bit earlier, was as you come through your career, you're, you know, obviously. The physicality of rugby means you might you might get into your early thirties like um Brad Thorne's probably an exception to get to like thirty nine, but you kinda start, you know, when you get to like late late twenties, early thirties, you're like, Well, I'm gonna exit out of this at some point. But when you're such a high level player and you come through the schoolboy system, sometimes and we see this a lot in other sports and golf especially, your identity can get wrapped up in, you know, I'm Graham the rugby player. Not like Graham, you know, the person with all this other you know and when that starts to, you know, when you start to like, you know, come out of that, how did you decide, you know, I'm going to do some study, you know, I can see an exit strategy here, I can see where I'm going to go after rugby. How do you deal with that whole, like, I suppose, identity piece and development, who you are, so that you can be more than just like, you know, Graham, that, 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 that goes to battle every weekend for, for Leicester or whatever, you know? Yeah, I think it's, it's tough. And we've, I think as a sport, we're getting much better at addressing it now. Um, because there have been situations maybe five, six years ago where, where boys have really struggled in that transition between, like you say, being a rugby player and then all of a sudden it gets taken away within within the space of a week, perhaps. Yeah. And, you know, you, you could be left with nothing. So I think as a sport, there's there's definitely a lot more emphasis on that now. For me, my, my first year at Worcester when I left school, uh, I took a sort of a gap year. I've all, I always wanted to study. I've always quite enjoyed it, but I took it as a gap year. And don't get me wrong, I, I enjoyed it. But, you know, I was coming home and just sitting on my ass playing Xbox or PlayStation or whatever. And I thought, you know, actually there is, as tough as it is, there is a lot of a lot of time that you get because, like you say, you can't, you can't train all day in, in a sport like rugby. You know, you will get that time off. I just, I've always wanted to use my time as well as I can. So to sort of do that study and then realise that, yeah, rugby's not gonna not gonna last forever. And you know, I'd, I'd seen a couple of boys have career career-ending injuries at you know early twenties. Right. Um, 
and that always sort of stuck in my mind as something that hopefully wouldn't. But if it did, would I be would I be in a situation where I was completely lost, or would I be able to you know have something in my back pocket that would at least make me a little bit more attractive to an employee, or would enable me to go and go and do something else? Um, but I think the identity thing is hard, and no matter how much study you do or you know how many other strings you got to your bow and, and lads do have a lot now you know there's there's all these courses lots of lots of boys are sort of taking that option but at the end of the day you still you still consider yourself a rugby player and you know, it's uh, as tough as it is it's it's great because you know people after the games you sign in autographs and you've got little kids looking at you like you're amazing when you know mm-hmm. Feel like you're not, but <laughs> yeah, I guess I, I don't know, but I, I, I assume that those are the those are the little things that you're going to sort of miss. And you know, if you are in five years' time, if I'm working in an office or something, it's not. It's definitely not the same. You've got to look for that, try and recreate that sort of buzz or or whatever it is, that sort of camaraderie with your teammates. It's it's going to be tough, and there's probably there's probably no way out, no uh, real way around it. You've just got to make sure that you're, you're prepared for it and you know what's coming. It's funny, I think you've like you've hit the nail on the head there, which is like, yeah, you have to prepare for it, knowing that it will come at some stage. But like, because I think what happens a lot, you know, if you do, but then bring yourself back to the fact that I am I'm a rugby player today and I got to do my part on the pitch. Whereas, you know, sometimes you, if if you just leave it in the shadows and don't think about it, when it does happen, then it hits you that little bit harder, and it hits you like you know it can be you know quite tough to. Uh, and I could, like it can be as any of us like obviously I'm a like a coach now, but anybody who's ever played at any decent level, it's like that moment when you come to the realization like I'm not, I'm not doing this anymore. It's a hard one because you have to, like you said, you know, you have to battle that. Like, oh, this is what I've always thought of myself of. But and I suppose one of the things that I, I think you guys do certainly have seen a lot of the Irish rugby players do quite well since whether they did went to broadcasting or. Some guys went into like they did their law degree and they're off doing laws. I think you, a lot of the resilience and grit that you develop as a professional athlete over a fairly long career, I presume you can channel that into whatever avenue you decide to go into after your rugby career. Um, and is that is that something that like excites you, or is it something that you look fuck? It's just at the back of my mind because I'm still solely focused on what I'm doing. Or where, where are you at with that? Yeah, no, I think it should be exciting. Um, I mean, I, I'm not 100% sure on, on what I want to do, but I'm doing a, it's like a financial advisor's course at the moment. And I guess it's it's kind of similar to starting off my career where you, know, you want to, if you do get qualified and that's what you decide you want to do, you're sort of starting at the bottom and you want to, you know, you want to get to the top. It's, it's that, I guess it's that competitive. <laughs> that's all I've done for 10, 12 years is, is try and, try and reach as high as I can go so I guess that will naturally translate into what you're doing um, and you know, a lot of the stuff coming out now is saying you know how sports people in general are, are quite employable because of the, the sort of skills that that we pick up during our careers you know it's that competitive net edge and I guess all the stuff you know trying to prepare well being diligent and, and those things are quite they're quite transferable so Hopefully, you know we can we can use those to our advantage, and I think I think you will sort of get a lot of carryover in in whatever you sort of carry on doing. Um, on like a couple of last ones to finish, Graham. I guess uh, if you were to go back, <clears throat> if you could go back and say like give your like your schoolboy self some advice as to what how to deal with the highs and lows that were to follow over the up to this point, um. What advice? What, what what advice would you give him? Not that anything was going to be different, but like in how to deal with all the stuff that was yet to come in terms of like what you've learned, I guess. Yeah, that's a tough one. Um, I think a lot of the, I think the high is actually. I was I've thought a little bit about this since since we won that uh, won the Premiership in 2013. It was. That was the last time we went to a final. I think at the time, like I spoke about before, that was almost the expected level that we'd win. And I think because of that, and because of that's how the group felt. I was a young boy. I was a young lad as well. So that was 
maybe my third season in, well, third, fourth, fifth professional season or whatever. I was I was fairly young, and to me, that was like, well, I'll be doing this again, you know, three or four times in my career. Oh, of course, yeah. In fact, you know, it was the last time I've been to a final, last time I won the Premiership, and I would probably say to myself, you know, just really enjoy that moment. I mean, don't get me wrong, I did, but you know, realise how special it is to to get to those levels and. I think that's similar in a lot of the big games we played in. Yeah, you know, played in the European semi-final. Um, sort of been been in and around England training squads, and, and never quite, you know, got to that level where I was capped. But you know, to sort of really appreciate those moments and, and realise because a lot of that would happen when I was younger. Mm-hmm. Well, I've got five, six, seven years where I can keep at this level, but. In actual fact, it might not happen that way. And uh, you know, every situation you've been in, just really enjoy it. Or, you know, in the case of those squads, you know, just make sure that this could be your last chance. So, you know, give it everything and don't expect that just because it's happening when you're 23, 24, it's, it's going to keep happening. You know, it's not the it's not, professional sport is pretty brutal and it's not always going to work out that way. So I guess that's, that's what I'd say for that, yeah. It's a brilliant one where I think... Um... I think you've hit the nail on the head there. I think sometimes in sport, we don't, we, we don't do, we don't either give our all in the moment that we're in, or we don't appreciate the moment that we're in because we're already playing some hypothetical moment that will happen down the line that's not guaranteed. Yeah, and I think like that's something that I think that uh, any young player who's coming up could really learn from, which is. Nothing in the future is guaranteed. So if you have a special moment right in front of you right now to make the absolute most out of it and give it everything you have because, you know, you, you're, you're not guaranteed anything other than what's in front of you uh, at this very moment in time. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Well, Graham, thanks a million. That was, uh, that was brilliant. I know I've learned absolutely heaps and I really appreciate you taking, I know we have a little bit more time than normal, but still I appreciate you taking a bit of time out of your day to help me learn a little bit and anybody who watches this as well yeah no worries pleasure thanks a million graham appreciate it thank you it is mate